Hello, my name is Ann Lawthers, and I'm a genealogist at the New England Historic and Genealogical Society in Boston, Massachusetts. For the next 20 minutes, I will be talking about westward migration after the Revolutionary War. This is the overview of my presentation. I'm going to talk about the push-pull factors affecting migration. I'm going to talk about the opening up of the land in the West. I'm going to talk about advances in transportation, which made much of the migration possible. And I will conclude with a discussion of federal policies and other stimulus, which many people don't think about in terms of um, pushing migration. So starting with the push-pull, the decision to migrate clearly depends on many factors. What pushed your ancestor out of the current location and what is pulling them to a new location? During this time period, factors such as the East Coast becoming crowded, um, urbanization, overpopulation, or at least the perception of overpopulation, um, lack of opportunities, especially for younger sons crop failures in the uh, area and financial disasters all pushed people out. And then we have the pull factors. Land was probably the number one uh, during this time period. It appeared to be limitless after the Revolutionary War. There was opportunity, opportunity to start over again. And the ease of getting there improved immeasurably. Advances in transportation transportation infrastructure, such as roads, canals, and the, the railroads. And then there was gold. That brought many, many people across the country. There was possibility of employment in a new place. And newspaper accounts. There are some really charming descriptions uh, from newspapers in, say, Kansas uh, and other Midwest states extolling the virtues of their communities. So let's talk about the land piece. A major factor in the post-war um, migration was land. Military bounty land strongly influenced um, the migration initially. So to entice soldiers to fight, the Congressional Congress in 1776 promised land in exchange for service. There were at least two problems with this promise. First of all, the Continental Congress didn't have any land to give at that point. And secondly, they had no system to distribute the land. Well, after the war, states had to cede land to the federal government because lo and behold, states were pretty much claiming all the same land. In the chart to the right, you will see the area that's called unorganized territory. Well, that was uh, claimed by Virginia. It was claimed by New York. Part of it was claimed by Connecticut. And these states had to negotiate with the federal government to uh, cede the land so that the federal government would then have land to make available to its soldiers. The period after the war also saw an explosive growth in speculative land, land companies. The Holland Land Company of New York was an example of one of the more prominent companies at the time. A group of Dutch investors purchased 3.2 million acres in western New York and hoped to sell the land quickly. But of course, everything took longer than expected. If your ancestors settled in Western New York, they may have purchased land from the Holland Land Company. Two other prominent land companies were the Ohio and Connecticut companies, and they operated in Ohio. The Ohio Company purchased land from the federal government as represented by the yellow in the lower uh, right-hand corner of the diagram, and the Connecticut Company operated off of Lake Erie in the northern part of Ohio. Both of these companies hoped to make a lot of money, but both of them ended up going bankrupt. And then there's the Louisiana Purchase. Although it took place in 1803, the settlement of the area could not take place until substantial 
advances in transportation systems were made available. So let's talk about some of those transportation advances. First, let's talk about roads. The National Road was built by congressional funds. It was authorized by Thomas Jefferson, who endorsed the creation of roads and canals to facilitate commerce and develop markets for agriculture, as well as to advance the settlement of the West. It was begun in 1811 in Cumberland, Maryland, reached Wheeling, West Virginia by 1818, and Vandalia, Illinois by 1837, when the money ran out. It was a huge economic boom. Taverns sprang up, probably one every 10 miles. But there were other roads in addition to the national roads, especially something known as a turnpike. Turnpikes were state chartered roads maintained by private investment companies. Roads were very expensive to construct, about $13,000 per mile. So private companies who fronted the money for the roads then set up toll booths along the turnpikes to collect fees to pay for the construction and maintenance of the roads. This also led to a boon for tavern keepers. Now, the post-revolutionary war also so, saw a huge uh, explosion in the development of canals. Between 1815 and about 1840, state governments and private investors constructed more than 3,000 miles of canals to connect lakes, rivers, etc. Canals were great. It was smooth travel, good for moving goods. You could move your glassware, no fear of breakage, and also was it uh, a good way to move people. One problem, canals froze in the winter. The Erie Canal may be the most famous canal opening in sections beginning in 1817 and com being completed in 1825. It opened Eastern and overseas markets for Midwestern farm products and also enabled migration westward. There were other canals constructed during this time period, such as the Ohio and Erie Canal, which is shown here in the middle of map, connecting Lake Erie with the Ohio River, or perhaps we can talk about the Illinois and Michigan Canal, which linked Lake Michigan and the Illinois River and really made the city of Chicago possible. If your ancestors moved in this time period, they might well have traveled by canal. These advances in transportation dramatically reduced travel time from point A to point B. So for example, if you started in New York City in 1800, it would take you about uh, uh, four weeks to reach the um, outlet of the Mississippi. However, by 1830, it would only take you two weeks. Now let's talk about one of the biggest forces in stimulating migration during the 19th century the railroads. In 1830, the first public railway in the United States, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, opened 23 miles of track. The steam locomotive called the Tom Thumb ran on the track and was designed and built specifically for the B&O. Well, construction of railroads quickly picked up. By 1840, there were numerous short railroads, but most of these railroads used differing track gauges, meaning that you couldn't connect the routes. By 1850, every state east of the Mississippi had a, a railroad. Now, this blow up of the map gives you a better idea of the little short segments that went between specific cities, but didn't connect the entire routes. It wasn't until the Civil War that these differences in track gauge were resolved and interconnectivity really became the norm. The Transcontinental Railroad. Discussions for this began as early as 1830, 
and it focused on what route the railroad might take. There was a northern route that followed the Missouri River. A central route followed the route of the Oregon Trail, which we'll talk about in a moment. But snow was an issue. The southern route across Texas, New Mexico territory in the Sonora Desert was also proposed. As you can imagine, there was a lot of political wrangling over which route was going to be the best. Well, the Pony Express, which only was in existence for about two years, proved that the central route could operate even in the winter. So Congress chartered the Central Pacific and Union Pacific Railroad companies in May of 1862 to build a transcontinental railroad. The two companies met in 1869 at Promontory Point, which is shown here on the right, to drive the Golden Spike and creating the Transcontinental Railroad. So let's briefly talk about federal policies. This chart shows some of the major influences on migration during the 19th century. Above the timeline, we have major federal policies, including the gold rush, which is not a federal policy, but a major event, and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, below the line on this uh, graph, we see the various wars and the financial panics. Let's talk first about the shrinking of the native tribe's land. Thomas Jefferson, our third president, hoped to encourage the native peoples to adopt European agricultural practices because he firmly believed that a semi-nomadic way of life was barbaric. In addition, a shift to a sedentary way of life would free up former hunting grounds for further white settlement. One of the first governmental uh, acts towards this vision was the Georgia Compact of 1802, where Georgia gave up its right to land in Alabama and Mississippi in exchange for some money and the federal government promising to move the Cherokee people from land that Georgia considered their own. The Louisiana Purchase we've already mentioned, but Jefferson saw it as a way to implement his plan of moving Eastern tribes west of the Mississippi. And then there was the Indian Removal Act of 1830, where tribes began to be forcibly removed from land on the Southeastern states and moved into the area west of the Mississippi. This led to the Trail of Tears. Now, the Preemption Act is one of the early acts that allowed settlers to buy land cheaply. Squatters living on federal land could purchase 160 acres for only $1.25 per acre before the land was offered to the general public. You had to be a head of a household, a single man over 21, or a widow, a citizen, or intending to become a citizen, and you had to live on the claim land for a minimum of 14 months. Much of the land in Kansas and Nebraska was settled on preemption claims. And then came the gold rush, beginning in 1848. It attracted over 300,000 opportunists, miners, and businessmen men to California. Now, the Homestead Act of 1862, similar to the Preemption Act, however, the land was free. Any adult citizen over the age of 21 could apply. They had to live on and improve the land for five years, which actually was a lot harder than it sounds. They could purchase the land if they'd lived there for at least six months. Now, quickly, let's talk about some of the financial panics. What's interesting about the panics, they all lasted at different times, um, but many of them were stimulated by speculation in railroad companies. And the last one, the Panic of 1893, was so deep that one in six American men lost their jobs. No wonder people decided to move west. 
let's talk briefly about, about some of the, of the trails that took people across the Great Plains. We had the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, the California Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail as just illustrations of some of the routes. Now, the Oregon Trail was first laid out in 1811 by trappers, but it was only a footpath. By 1836, wagons could travel all the way to Fort Hall, Idaho. And in 1843, 1,000 1, settlers left Elm Grove, Missouri for Oregon. Now, the Oregon Trail crossed the Continental Divide at South Pass, Wyoming. And shortly after South Pass, Wyoming, the Oregon Trail and what became known as the Mormon Trail split. The Oregon Trail goes north, the Mormon Trail goes south into Utah. So a brief summary, you need to identify the push and pull factors for your specific ancestors when talking about migration. Post-revolutionary war migration was fueled by bounty land and speculative land companies. Significant developments in transportation included the turnpike, a system of canal, and of course the railroads. Federal policies also affected migration, such as the Indian Removal Act, the Preemption Act, and the Homestead Act. And don't forget the financial panics as a push factor in 19th century migration. Thank you.